right now on uh, two uh, operas, and we're also working on, uh, we've just done two curatorial projects. Um, but for some reason, I've just, you know, um, assembled work that kind of belongs to a different category today. Um, it does, it does uh, delve into a couple of different media, um, and in some way, it, it comes back to um, a concentration around the city and a kind of faith uh, in the city as a platform for architecture, an architecture that has a, uh, that's maybe politically motivated, um, a kind of belief that there is an opportunity for architecture uh, to be relevant, um, and an architecture that transcends the vanity uh, of um, a discipline that tends to sometimes be uh, autonomous. Um, and, um, you know, a concentration on the city as um, we look at the world becoming more and more urban, um, we are beginning to see um, what used to be a futility around the city, perhaps now the importance of bold local action in the city. Um, and our consciousness, or at least my consciousness, um, really starts here at ground zero. Um, not to say that before that we weren't doing urbanly orient, uh, urban oriented work, we were doing a lot of interventions uh, in the city, but there was something um, you know, incredibly powerful that happened here and um, we, we, act, we acted in a different way, in a new way. Um, so immediately after the attack on the World Trade Center, uh, shaken New Yorkers had a deep desire to go to ground zero, uh, the si side of the wreckage. And at this time, the public wasn't allowed to get anywhere near the site, um, held back uh, three quarters of a mile or something like that. Um, and the area was um, totally chaotic and it was filled with uh, recovery and then uh, 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 vehicles that were um, cleaning up the wreckage and so forth. And uh, the reason for pushing the public away was to avoid um, even more uh, chaos uh, by gawkers. Um, but we had to ask ourselves, why did everyone want to actually go there, go to the site, uh, somehow bear witness on the physical site? Um, you couldn't escape the images all over the media, all over the papers, uh, every publication, every media outlet, um, constantly. We saw the same images again and again. Um, the air at that time was toxic with the smell of um, burning plastic and metal and rubber and furniture and carpets. It was the smell of death and it was everywhere. Um, nevertheless, the desire to be at the actual spot of the attack was really persistent. And I understood that, um, but um, I, I kind of thought about it really in reverse. I couldn't actually look at the skyline. For a full week, I was unable to actually um, just look up and our apartment is high up and, and it had a view of the World uh, Trade Towers. Um, but then, you know, I finally brought myself uh, to look and then I couldn't look away at the hole in the skyline. There was something about vision and our studio has always been interested in the culture of vision. Vision in terms of the politics of vision, in terms of um, the, the per perception, issues of perception and so forth. Um, so vision was always a, a, a part of it, but there was such a persistent need to kind of be there and witness, uh, be an eyewitness. Um, why was it? Was it a perverse love of the macabre? Or was it a, a case of schadenfreude, if, that, if I'm pronouncing the world, word correctly? Uh, or was it um, a kind of empathy? Or um, was the desire to look there a kind of um, collective need to grieve in public by being there and looking um, in, in the physical space? Um, many professionals were summoned to, to go to the site um, and, but, but I would say uh, the large, um, uh, the largest amount of people that, that went there um, as professionals were volunteers that wanted to help. There were like doctors and, and chefs and firemen, rescue workers, all of that. Um, and as architects, um, we felt a civic responsibility to somehow be there to act, but how would we act? 
And there was a kind of urgency. Ben and I were talking about urgency. You know, there was a kind of urgency there that I'd never felt before. Um, all our lives are always in architecture, very long lead, very long cycles. All of a sudden, my, you know, something happened. And when I had this kind of intense need to somehow participate, so while the city was totally disorganized and there was no bureaucracy to stop us, um, we joined forces with our friend David Rockwell and Kevin Kennan and organized a kind of architectural SWAT team and got some money and uh, made a foundation and um, uh, put together something like $300,000 to erect um, a, a viewing platform. And this is basically, I mean, this is the way the site these are the only uh, people that were able to come to the site. So we built this, this platform, and you know, it was nothing major architecturally. It was a 300-foot long ramp um, on Fulton Street. It rose up 13 feet in the air, and it just um, went up to uh, a viewing platform. Basically, it was made of simple uh, plywood and scaffolding. Um, and at the end of the ramp, um, People would just crowd there to see what was no longer there. Um, there was a comfort in seeing the emptiness of the site. And I have to say, the city was never the same after this, uh, this event. Um, there was a, a sense of shared vulnerability. You felt um, no longer as an individual. You felt um, as a kind of piece of the city, a part of the city. Um, every, an act like this was an act of generosity to help um, do what you could do in your um, expertise to make things a little bit better. Uh, but you really felt like um, your presence in the city in a kind of dangerous global context. And um, architecture was the actual object of attack here. Arch this minor architecture was a response. And, um, and it was just because for us it was that architecture was taken out of the hands of the clients, taken out of the hands of uh, everyone, and just, um, and we were just, we did what we felt was right and no one stopped us. And there was something about um, that change for me. I mean, this ground zero is a kind of awakening, I guess, for me, um, to an architecture um, act as an act of citizenship. Um, and the kind of conventional thinking at that time was that architecture was futile, one could really not make change, started to change for me um, as an endeavor. And so I just uh, put that out there and move on to uh, a, different, a different type of project, more of a research project that we mounted in a museum, uh, but it also has to do with the fate of, of the city. Um, and um, more and more we've come to see uh, cities as the front line of diplomacy. Um, this project um, is, takes a look at um, human population shifts to cities. Um, and for many different reasons, for political, economic, and environmental reasons. Um, and this is not an act of physical intervention, but um, it is a different kind of intervention um, in terms of a, a, a project that takes on a different um, language, and that is one of d data visualization, something that greatly interests us. Um, this project called Exit, Exit is an immersive um, animated video installation, and this is just starting with this. Um, home is not what it used to be, and it takes on this issue of what is home. Um, and this was staged at the Fondation Cartier in Paris. Uh, we did it with Paul Virilio, and Laura Kurgan and Mark Hansen. Laura Kurgan is an architect. Mark Hansen is a, um, a statistician, an artist. And we did it with a whole team of programmers, graphic artists, and geographers. Um, and the setup of this um, installation was uh, basically a, a big room. Um, it's about uh, 15 feet in, uh, no, 15 meters in uh, diameter. and um, and there's a globe that orbits this circular room, and it prints and erases information with each orbit. One orbit takes about 45 seconds. The entire narrative is about 55 minutes in length. Um, and so the, the imprints are typically maps made from data. And the data has been collected from about 100 sources. It's geocoded. 
and it's processed through programming language and translated visually. Um, the resulting narrative and sound environment is uh, entirely data driven. So this was the kind of first experiment. This is actually a still from the video. And you could see here um, the globe is actually backwards. And so when it rotates along the wall as a video flat image, it uh, illusionistically, it, it, it goes around the space, um, it, um, it prints. It prints and erases, so that's why it's backwards. So we tell the story of uh, like six stories of human migration. And the first one, and oh my god, well, there's no sound here. This was supposed to be sound, I don't know. So um, the, initially the globe rolls out a field of pixels. One pixel represents a thousand people that populate the planet. And um, this starts in 2007, the distribution of the world's populations, um, you know, after that started to cross a significant threshold. And um, at a certain point, 50% um, of the global population lived in cities. Um, so we start with uh, around uh, 2000 or just before 2000 and we go um, several decades out. So the familiar image of uh, global land masses throughout the piece is made only with geocoded data. So that is not an illustration, that's basically just pixels moving to the right spot um, given the, uh, the programming um, and the, the geocoding. So uh, so what we see here, and, and virtually this experiment in data visualization is truly about just simply getting the facts in, and actually getting the facts was not so easy because in the hundred sources of data, a lot of them are false and we had to figure out what's real and what's not. But here you could see the dec decline of populations um, in different parts of the world and the um, also, where you see the, the vertical spikes are the elevations in, uh, in, in cities, that is the, uh, the fastest growing cities, which by the year 2015, next year, will be located mostly, uh, I, I would say 48 out of 50 uh, of the fastest growing cities will be in the developing world. Okay, and this is another chapter, so I'm, I'm just um, kind of splicing this together um, to give you a sense of it. This was about rem remittances, um, and remittances comprise an informal economic network that plays a crucial role in the developing world. Um, at this point where we started the research, 150 million uh, migrants worldwide sent money home in the form of remittances. And these transactions were typically in the amounts of $100, $200, $300. And these remittances added up to 300 billion, which is twice the amount of total global foreign aid. So in there, the, the country flags are also geolocated over the country that they represent. And the graphic erosion on the map represents the relative percentage of population. Um, this chapter um, is about forced migration and political refugees. And while mobility is often a metaphor for freedom, it's sometimes a tragic necessity. Um, and the threats faced by people who are otherwise attached to their land but forced to move um, or perils faced by those who want to move and find their paths largely, largely predetermined or simply blocked. So this shows um, the global movement of refugees or internally uh, displaced people, IDPs, and it starts, the sequence starts from 1991 and goes all the way forward. Um, one pixel is 10 refugees. Um, the journeys made by forced migrants, whether they're refugees, asylum seekers, or internally displaced people, also reveal the, the obstacles they meet along the way. So refused asylum, turned back at the border, uh, detainment, or even worse. Now you have to imagine this, this installation surrounds you and 
the, the sound is also designed. Okay, in another chapter, we talk about natural disasters, um, which have been increasing steadily since the year 2000. Um, and by that time, um, tripling um, the populations just 10 years before that that were displaced. Um, this scene looks at the effects of migration at the new uh, equator, the line that divides global north from global south, the line across. It's a socioeconomic and political division that exists between wealthy developed countries uh, and uh, the developing countries. And here you could see um, there's a kind of comparison of flood events um, in the same magnitude. That is, the, the, the severity of the event is the same, but there's a comparison between global north and global south. And you could see that uh, the populations that are more vulnerable uh, generally are in the global south, and it's a factor of wealth um, and poverty and the existence of government infrastructure. Um, and here you can, you can see that, that, that same magnitude event above and below. Um, and here, this goes on and on, and I'll move uh, through this. This, is, um, this, this uh, has to do with the uh, global emissions. Now again, all geocoded. It's not an illustration. Um, and uh, it's about the emissions of carbon dioxide um, that, uh, and, the, and the thermal change that's expected over the next 50 years uh, and the rising of sea level. Um, and um, there's also a chapter here on desertification and deforestation and the loss of language and these things that, don't, that you don't typically see together. Um, this project allowed us to relate geographical, economic, and environmental um, as well as political data that are typically seen in isolation. We see them in maps. We see them separated from each other. But when, you, when they're put together, they actually produce some new information. And um, some policymakers that have seen this uh, piece said that, that they actually, um, there was more, there was new information that was formed that made them understand um, uh, the conditions um, that, that were happening at the same time. And again, you know, this is not, there's no spin here. Uh, there's a kind of aesthetic uh, decision about colors and uh, effects, but, but the information is the information. Anyway, I will just move to a totally different kind of project. Um, the, a city particularly affected by its own singular environmental uh, issue, and that is Venice. Um, this is the postcard view. Um, Venice is, uh, as we all know, is not only affected by sea level rise, but it's sinking for other reasons. And it has an antiquated sewage system. Um, for the Biennale, several Biennales ago, um, we had this idea of uh, converting uh, Venice's often photogenic but notoriously filthy canal water into the best espresso in Italy. And um, we really progressed this, uh, this project a lot, and we engineered this project. Um, the installation was based on um, water purif purification, um, a particular system that sped up the cleansing effects of tidal wetlands. Um, and basically, the project uh, was a transparent glass pipe that passes through uh, a window um, of one of the buildings in the Arsenale would draw water from the adjacent canal and propel it through a state-of-the-art purification system that first filtered the water and then distilled it out of sludge, sewage, and toxins. Then the water uh, was clean enough, uh, when the water was clean enough to drink, so it went through several uh, cycles of cleansing, um, it fell like an, uh, uh, well, you can kind of see there, but like an IV drip where it got boiled into steam um, and forced through coffee grounds to become the quintessential it Italian pick-me-up, um, served in a central espresso bar in the center of the exhibition. Um, the project revealed the tremendous resources required to sustain even our most quotidian comforts and called into qu question an implicit social contract. That is, when we turn on the faucet, water will always be safe, clean, and drinkable. Um, 
With this project, uh, the tourists could drink Venice. Uh, and unfortunately, th this project went all the way up the ladder. It was engineered. Uh, it was, uh, we had the fabricators, we had the water um, uh, purification company involved already. We had raised a considerable amount of money. Um, and it had gone through all the health regulations. And it was ultimately stopped at the last minute. Um, that was due to political fallout because of a premature letting of a water purification contract. So um, in Venice at the time, there were many contracts that were starting to be uh, bid out to many companies. And this would be a premature um, uh, letting of a contract. So unfortunately, we didn't manage to do this. but. Um, we uh, did it in our minds, as most projects. 90% uh, of them are done in our brains um, and never see the light of day. Um, but anyway, what's a great cup of coffee without a cigarette? Um, however, smoking has become a symbol of the conflict between individual freedom and collective responsibility in the city. Um, this is a, a basically, wow, that's so weird. That blue is actually yellow. Um, it's like a normal filter, but it's really kind of beautiful what's happening here. This is a whole new presentation <laughs> you're seeing. I'm actually not. <laughs> anyway, um, so um, in, in, in our uh, new regulations, in new regulations that are uh, I, I don't want to mess with this because we may lose the... Do you like the blue or we can change it? I kind of like it. Okay. I, it's okay. I thought you were just a genius. <laughs> no, it's much better. Um, but when we look at the new regulations um, uh, in most cities, the, the cigarette is a reminder that one may not necessarily have the right to be self-destructive in a culture that aspires to share health care costs. And increasing efforts to reduce smoking and secondhand smoke in public spaces have created a new urban outlaw, which we're very interested in. Um, the last spatial refuge for the lone smokers outside the no smoking establishment. This project is called No No Smoking, and, and that should be read. <laughs> I'm going to have to narrate. <laughs> um, and the installation um, basically um, mediates the smoker's conflicting status as a villain and a victim. So uh, a system of chimneys is uh, attached to no smoking locations. Um, and basically, you know, uh, there are uh, concert halls and, and uh, libraries and, um, and even restaurants and bars. Um, and basically, these um, chimneys lift secondhand smoke at the public sidewalk above the street. Um, so this uh, was conceived as a kind of system. And um, basically, inside, um, this was, and this was to be in Amsterdam. You know, we never really could quite pull it off. That's another one of those things that we went close. We couldn't raise the money. But basically, um, it's a smoke-activated uh, interface. And it detects, basically, the first puff and, um, and then this, there's a smoke detector that triggers a private network when it senses that first exhale, and the virtual network connects outposts of the subculture throughout the city. And uh, here are a couple of, of those sites. But we're constantly thinking about, um, you know, the systems in the city, and, um, you know, as we kind of work in all different media. You know, some of the media are actually good old-fashioned architecture and uh, involve buildings. And um, many of the projects that we've been doing over the last decade or so, um, they're, they're basically explore cultural, political, and socio-economic uh, uh, issues. Um, they often do it um, uh, through a single building or maybe you know, a couple of, um, uh, in, in this case, um, there were a whole series of interventions on this Lincoln Center site. Um, but our work somehow kind of falls into two channels. One is um, this, the building is seen as the redeemer of urban planning flaws, which here all of our work um, 
um, really kind of acted to kind of undo some of the bad miscalculations of the planning that was done um, in the late 50s. And um, wow, it's all polarized. It's amazing. Um, so, and these are just, just a couple of the stills from that. And um, the other category that, that the work falls into is the cultural institution as a catalyst in urban economic development. Um, and uh, these projects have been uh, widely published. I don't want to um, really go into them, but um, just to put it into context that somehow um, these singular buildings are acting um, in a very particular way in the city, um, in a catalytic way. And this project that I did want to show you in Rio de Janeiro is, um, uh, is called the Museum of, Im <coughs> of Image and Sound. It's a museum for the culture of the city of Rio. It's, it's about the, city, the film, the music, the photography, entertainment, telenovelas, comedy. It has uh, the Carmen Miranda collection of shoes and headdresses. Um, and it's a site right at the building wall of, <coughs> of Copacabana Beach. So it's against um, that in that backdrop, which is just an unbelievable opportunity. Um, and in the public imagination, Rio is a place of scenic beauty and hedonistic pleasures. Um, it's unaffected uh, by the socioeconomic realities of, of the everyday, I and mean, that's the way we like to think about it. Um, but the city has, has lost its glamour over the years, and favelas uh, ring Rio are producing a super juxtaposition of the haves and the have-nots. And given... Um, <laughs> I love it. This is so psychedelic. <laughs> um, so uh, given this diverse population um, <laughs> of the Blue Man group extended, <laughs> um, so, so given the, the problems that Rio has had in urbanization, um, the beach is actually Rio's most democratic site. Uh, it unifies the city, it's a place of socializing around natural resources, it's a place of display and spectacle at the scale of the singular suntan body, um, you know, up to the events that draw millions of people at uh, New Year's. Um, the building is, um, <laughs> is conceived as an extension of the Avenida Atlantica, um, uh, and the mosaic that uh, Roberto Mur uh, Burley Marx did on the boulevard, which extends the whole way, and here is a, more of a detail of it. Um, and so the, the boulevard basically, uh, for us, um, becomes like the starting point, and it becomes stretched into a kind of vertical boulevard that will traverse indoor and outdoor uh, spaces. So this, basically, this um, um, kind of branching network of stairs and ramps uh, moves in and out of the building into galleries and culminating in a rooftop um, uh, kind of panoramic space that's open to everyone. Um, so the, the, the idea is that the building would unite beach culture and museum culture. Anyone can come from the beach take a shower at the edge of the building, climb the building um, at the outside stair um, for free, you know, and, and just be up uh, at the top of the, of the building. Or could weave in and out of the indoors and outdoor space. Um, this is um, an early sketch that just showed the kind of layout of the galleries and, and basically the stairs access half levels of galleries. Um, the view um, of Copacabana Beach is the museum's most potent physical holding, and that is the postcard view. So, you know, while it has all these artifacts inside, what it has is this view that's typically just given to tourists or very wealthy people that have um, apartments on the on the edge of the beach. Um, so, we felt that um, um, the view through the facade should be curated. It could be turned on and off. It could be dispensed slowly in small doses and as one moves up and down the stairs from gallery to gallery. And the skin, um, and so this is uh, basically um, just taking apart the view and uh, subdividing the view into 
um, segments um, and different, uh, com basically a kind of um, anal analysis of the view into its component parts. And the facade itself is, um, is, very, is, is deep and it allows views in certain ways. So it behaves, this is actually what the facade will be. It's like cilia, it's like little hairs that you see through these hairs and they're oriented one way or the other. And um, you will be able to, and this is uh, from a mock-up, um, and you'll be able to um, uh, uh, basically, uh, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't give it away. It just makes the view a kind of lenticular effect, a kind of tease. Um, and we felt that it was architecture's role here to leverage the photogenic quality of the site to make this um, uh, thick inter interface um, at which um, two views were given over, the, the kind of curated view, the uncurated view, where culture and leisure were brought together, woven together, where high and low were woven together, um, uh, as well as the diverse populations of Rio. And this building is, um, and this is the top, and this is free to the public, and um, in construction right now. Now, just moving to another city, um, it's, it's no wonder that Spike Jones's meditation on the um, culture of the near future is set in a kind of nondescript city that appears to be a mashup of Los Angeles and Shanghai and uh, largely shot in, in Los Angeles. Um, we have been thinking and working on LA for a while, for a number of years, and um, you know, it's, it's hard to exactly shake the, um, the influence of, uh, of Bannum um, and the way that um, he rejoiced over the qualities uh, of a decentralized Los Angeles. Uh, as unlike any city in the world, so it wasn't a, a bad thing, it was a very good thing. Um, LA organized by regional geograph geography and, and freeways. And um, when we came into uh, 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 this project, um, which is the uh, Broad Museum, um, which is uh, right, right there in uh, central Los Angeles, um, it was, this romance that was created by Bannum, I think, um, ended for me uh, when we started the design of this building. And I actually became a little bit of a believer that maybe downtown Los Angeles, maybe there was something to kind of changing it up and not just reveling in its weirdness, but, or maybe it was a collision of the two. Um, so the, the project, oh, so a little bit about um, the history of the site, I, I should just mention that the, 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 the museum is, is a, it's actually for a collection of a singular co collector, Eli Broad, um, and it's on Bunker Hill. And um, the site is um, someplace in there. I mean, these are early images. It was conceived in the late 50s as part of the city's first effort to appease the political and business elites that were clamoring for urban renewal in this part of the city. So the residential area that was there was shaven clean by 1970, this, this image that you see. Um, and planners envisioned a downtown with a very muscular center. Um, there was uh, a lot of growth of um, individual buildings with little urban logic. Um, there was, uh, it was always felt quite empty and very weird. Um, fast forward to um, 1992 to 2003, um, during downtown LA's so-called Renaissance. Um, Disney Hall here was imagined as the ultimate silver bullet that would regenerate downtown single-handedly. So it was still a kind of extension of the city, beautiful idea, um, which was going all wrong in all different directions. But it was a symbol of the power of architecture, this building, to, uh, to incite and nurture urbanism. Um, and opened in 2003. Uh, it's an amazingly significant building, very beautiful. But I have to say, it has not catalyzed a sense of urbanity in LA. Um, still feels quite the same. And um, Disney Hall was just one um, cultural building that came before and uh, before us. And it followed a set, a, a set of other buildings 
uh, to become an ensemble of monuments that could be traced back to um, those early days of City Beautiful. And you could see that it's kind of like a pearl necklace of, of uh, monumental buildings. So building, the, the, uh, building on the concert hall success in around 2005, there was um, this uh, Grand Avenue project which was conceived uh, to give the city a kind of thriving center again. And uh, LA was conceived to be a kind of Champs-Elysees. Um, this is purely on American terms. Um, and critics of this project say that it was so deeply flawed, not only because it's fundamentally elitist and produces a gentrified urban vacuum, um, and um, the, the very idea of a singular dominant uh, cultural hub lies um, or runs counter to the city's nature. So the critics of the project were basically saying you can never make a city center. Um, Anyway, to come with all this baggage into the project um, was complicated because it wasn't just a building, it was, um, you know, how could this building contribute or, um, or not to this uh, desire to change LA. And while we were happy to get the commission to build the museum, um, we were never delusional about the building's role in the success of the uh, Grand Avenue project. The question was how not, to f f um, how not to fall into the cynicism that urbanism is beyond the ability of a single um, architectural project, and that was um, super important. In any case, um, a bigger and more immediate problem was how do you build on the site next to Disney Hall, um, a site uh, on the left that was zoned for a much smaller project. Um, so you could see that the dotted line defines the edges and the, and the height. We couldn't go any bigger or any wider than this, yet the program was bigger than that. So whatever you did there had to be a box, no matter what. So it couldn't compete in any way with the kind of exuberance of Disney Hall. Um, and it didn't want to. Um, it had to uh, basically optimize its, um, its, it, uh, the volume that it inherited. Um, and uh, in deciding not to try to compete, um, it would be a relationship through contrast. While Disney Hall is smooth and shiny, dispersing light outwardly, the museum is porous and absorptive, channeling light into its core. And um, it's kind of a, maybe a little bit of a reductive relationship, but that's where we started. Now, one of the curious things about this project is that um, there, it is mostly a storage facility. Um, it is a, a place to house the collection, and only a certain percentage of it goes on display. So this is on the most important street in LA that is trying to be urbanized. It, it is actually um, a, basically a warehouse. So we had to think about, well, how do you you know, what is the relationship between the museum and the warehouse? Is the museum inside of the warehouse? Uh, is the warehouse inside of the museum? And, um, and then we came up with this kind of um, strategy of um, the veil, what we call the veil and the vault. The vault is basically um, the container for the collection. It's the storage of the collection. And the veil is a very, very porous, uh, material, um, which ultimately is concrete, that allows um, uh, diffuse light to come through in every direction, um, and it puts a box, a kind of housing, over the vault, um, and it also is the structure. So here you see um, uh, that this, that the basically the veil is a long span uh, over this building, which is about 200, like about 70 meters long. Uh, in both directions. And what it produces um, is, uh, well, I'll go back, is a kind of sublime space above um, and a kind of um, a very obtuse space, a space that you could never understand where the collection sits. Um, and um, this was an idea that, uh, that we had hoped for, kind of drive through um, valet parking uh, lobby, but we couldn't really accomplish that. Um, and then beyond is the um, entrance into the main gallery, which is on the top floor, so it's just three floors. And you come up this long escalator and arrive in this one acre of art um, that's totally column free. So it's extremely 
um, uh, ext ext extremely flexible. Um, and the geometries are worked through um, in a digital project. We did a lot of uh, modeling of this and um, it's, it's very precise in the way that light is dispersed. Uh, but basically the idea is that you arrive on the site uh, into a public space, you shoot up through the escalator, through the vault, um, you see the display, um, and then you come back slowly. Um, and that's where you're exposed to the pre-curated work. So um, you basically see the collection and understand this as a singular collection. It's not a museum of many things. It is one, uh, one mind, one collector, and, and basically this, like a suitcase, gets unpacked and repacked, unpacked and repacked on top of the building. So this is now um, in construction. Its structural premise is now steel clad in concrete. We could, weren't able to realize with the seismic problems in LA everything that we wanted to. And this is um, just moments in the construction. And you could see that you know, it's very much like the early um, images that we had made. Um, the museum doesn't presume to uh, fix LA, um, and it doesn't um, buy into the imported logics of the European city, but instead it engages with a little bit of Bantham's um, plurality of form. Um, the project is urbanistically conceived. It coyly flirts with views um, into the museum from afar, from passing vehicles and from the sidewalk, um, even if subtly it interfaces with the street and plaza next door to break down the tight wall of the institution, which in a museum most of the time is solid and blank. Um, a building cannot make or break a city. It can play a small role in making, I believe, an interface, a better interface. Um, a project that we are just um, starting is uh, in another part of the world. Um, it's in Moscow, and uh, we won a competition to do Zaryadye Park, um, just next to the Kremlin and just next to Red Square. It's on the grounds of the ruin of the Hotel Russia, uh, which is a Soviet-era hotel. It was the largest hotel in the world, it had like 6,000 rooms. Um, and our project, and this was just uh, so bizarre because in a period of the Second Cold War, for uh, the US and Russia, um, the idea that an American architect would win this international competition was unthinkable. And uh, somehow we did, I'm not sure, maybe it was a mistake. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, we are uh, starting this project and um, the, our thought was um, uh, something that we called wild urbanism. It's basically a proposal to create a kind of promiscuous mix of urban and uh, kind of wild features. Um, in Moscow, there's a dearth of public parks, so this is um, really intended to be the most public of public parks and one that where navigation isn't prescribed. Um, and we, we started to think about the importance of parks, and we've been working on, on landscape projects for a while. Um, initially, the city, that is, when we think about the evolution of the city, it was conceived as a defense from the ravages of, uh, ravages of nature. That is, a place, the park was a, a place to escape, uh, or the city was uh, conceived as a place to escape the hostility of um, uncontrolled weather, disease, and predators. But the success of cities and their byproducts has tipped the ecological scale, and the vast natural environment, which once seemed inexhaustible, now appears fragile, and moving forward, as global citizens um, will prove to be a balancing act in which the natural and the artificial are no longer dualistically opposed, but rather partners intertwined in a dynamic and complex ex exchange. Um, so the park um, incorporates um, uh, different climates uh, from different, uh, actually, landscapes in Russia, tundra, steppe, forest, and wetlands. And these zones are um, organized and uh, basically they're organized um, in terraces that descend from one corner of the side to the other. Um, and they create a set of program spaces that are integrated into the, into the landscape. So um, there are no buildings. Those buildings are just the um, part of the um, elevational shifts in those, uh, 
in, in those uh, uh, pieces. And um, using a unique paver system, and I, I can't, I actually, doesn't really show, but um, there's a unique paver system that seamlessly knits a uh, landscape with walking surfaces. So the park is kind of pathless, and uh, people are free to move about uh, in entirely unscripted ways, so there are no prescribed axes. Um, sustainable technologies and en energy harvesting uh, creates augmented microclimates that encourage 24-7 year-round enjoyment. So uh, Moscow is really, really cold in the winter, and the normal expectancy of enjoying the park is just is not very many months. So um, in this, we could make um, actually summer and winter and winter and summer. Um, so the landscape, um, this is just the one axis that's framed. Um, and uh, this is just um, at the edge of San Basil, so you can see that. Um, anyway, this project, um, if we live to see the day when it's completed, um, it hopefully will really um, uh, be a, a beginning to a, uh, an initiative in Moscow that really is intended to uh, bring more of a residential population back, to make Moscow more of a living city. Um, so in another direction, um, interested in um, acts of landscape disobedience like um, summer and winter and winter and summer, um, this is a grove of horn, uh, hornbeam trees that was planted in a brownfield site um, en route to Liverpool. And some of the trees you can see here are subject to unusual behaviors. Um, So we, you know, we like to pervert nature just a little bit. Um, and <laughs> moving on to um, the High Line, and I, I chose to show this project. It's it's very well known. I'm sure um, some of you who have been to New York recently have had a chance to walk it. Um, I, the reason why I like to kind of show it and and talk about it a bit is that um, it's it's something that we're constantly trying to figure out. What did we do here? And how did this happen? Um, so to put it into context, uh, let's, okay, to put it into context, um, we, in 2002, we became part of this um, very unusual urban planning initiative um, that is transforming the, the High Line into a public park. We did this with field operations and Piet Udolf. And this industrial railway, which stretches a mile and a half from the meatpacking district up to the Hudson Yards at 34th Street, um, uh, basically um, was abandoned um, for a long time and, and kind of left to rot, left as a ruin. Um, and just a little bit about its history, it's very interesting. You could see the train on the ground there. And in the mid-19th century, cargo arriving by ship uh, to the west side of Manhattan basically was distributed along 10th Avenue um, to factories and warehouses. And, um, and it, did it, it did so on the ground. And as the population grew, so did the pedestrian conflicts. So trains often ran over pedestrians. And so to prevent casualties, um, they uh, put a cowboy in front of the trains to, as an escort. And basically the cowboy would just kind of make the pedestrians move out of the way as the train would come. And there were like a whole series of these cowboys. Um, and um, at a certain point, they decided that, um, okay, so that they decided to build the High Line. It was like around 1929 at the height of the Depression. And the High Line for about 50 years, and so this detached the uh, train traffic from uh, motor traffic. And this is, you speed up to 50 years later, um, this was the very last um, uh, train that went down the High Line. And um, at a certain point, the highway system took over, and uh, uh, tr uh, trucks were now distributing goods, and this became um, a really inefficient um, way of distributing goods. So, um, so the High Line basically went to pot, and this was um, a video that we took just um, the day uh, 
that we were I I engaged in the competition, we went up there. Of course, you were not allowed to go there, um, so you would be arrested. But um, we went up there, and, uh, and the, the, it was really beautiful because it had a kind of illicit quality that you weren't supposed to be there that made it all the better. Um, and this is what we found. It was really pretty, um, pretty nasty, but also very, very engaging. Now, um, we didn't realize at that time, um, the, the High Line had been all, um, the, the fight to defend the High Line had happened um, just before the competition. And it happened with the Bloomberg administration the moment that they came into power. So um, two activists, um, very young guys, decided that they wanted to save the High Line and they used um, their political uh, uh, know-how and they got members of the potential new administration um, very interested in it. Um, at some point they, uh, working even before that, uh, commissioned uh, Joel Sternfeld, a photographer, to photograph the High Line. And these photographs were published um, in a popular magazine and was the first time that the public actually got a whiff of um, the kind of beautiful magic of this overgrown, um, uh, self-seeded landscape. Um, and these, these photos were, were published. I don't know what happened actually between these photos and when we went up there because it really went, it was beautiful here. Um, but uh, Giuliani, as his last act as mayor, signed the demolition order and Bloomberg uh, reversed the court order and the High Line was saved. And then um, came the competition. And um, basically we were, this is also Sternfeld, and you could see um, the different kinds of plantings that were there. And this is, it all came off of trains or were windswept. And the ballast of the soil that was there for the tracks I mean, basically was the medium um, that the stuff grew. Um, to most people um, in the street, it just looked like this. And it was very hard to imagine that um, somehow this was going to be um, so, you know, such a uh, um, beautiful opportunity um, for a, uh, uh, an urban project. Um, so the, the point was that Giuliani wanted to destroy the, this uh, because it would elevate the cost of, uh, or the, uh, the value of the property for the property owners around, which um, f felt like if it, that eyesore were gone, they would be able to uh, build tall buildings in a largely uh, kind of uh, nasty area where there were a lot of parking lots, open parking lots. Anyway, uh, we came on board and we um, kind of fell in love with this kind of um, uh, what we found there, which was um, basically um, a mile and a half of micro environments. Um, there were areas that were sun-drenched, that were shady, that were wet, that were dry, windy conditions. Um, areas that were uh, uh, sheltered and open to the wind. A whole variety of different um, species, given the microclimate, took root and gradually thickened into a living mat. So um, everything from rank weeds, low grasslands, um, all sorts of encroachments, sumac woods, um, and so forth. Um, so the Highline had uh, produced its own ecosystem of flora and also fauna. So these microecologies grew over a hundred species. Um, and uh, there was this beautiful yielding of man the man-made to the natural. Um, that is a, a piece of uh, industrial uh, archaeology. It felt like that um, after a radical time lapse. And so the question was, how do you bring people up there um, without destroying the ecological balance. Um, and it was, it's really um, kind of, uh, it's very hard to imagine um, that the landscape in this very, very narrow space and the public up there could actually somehow interweave. And, um, you know, we wanted to, as part of the beautiful melancholia of the site, we wanted to. Uh, retain that. Um, there was a bis, bit of nostalgia for a lost industrial culture. There were the cycles of life, uh, decay and rebirth. And the project um, was actually um, not the slide before because that's the problem. That's the, what you didn't want to do. What you did want to do was something like this, 
which is um, basically a kind of blend um, of nature and culture where there's a, kind of, there's a sense of one taking over the other, a kind of conquest here of, uh, of man over nature, and then nature comes back and makes its conquest. Um, so we proposed a new blend, and the, basically the whole architectural idea was this. Um, it's a new blend of vegetal and mineral called, um, called agritecture, um, part agriculture, part architecture. The surface of the High Line was digitized. Um, each unit could be either organic growth or in an in a organic building material, and the units could be assembled in different proportions. So from 100% greenscape to 100% um, uh, hardscape or any um, gradient in between. And um, there are a whole variety of different planks um, that came together. And the, the, the tapering of the planks is very, very important in the way that it feathered into uh, the vegetal growth. And here it is um, starting to be assembled. Now, of course, it's a really complicated project because the soil there was toxic, had to all be removed, uh, the structure had to be remediated. Um, but the, the very top coat was this um, paving system. And uh, this is the view from uh, Standard Hotel. So um, we managed to um, have completed two thirds of this project already, and the last third, it's like um, the beauty of um, uh, working on something that's like a sausage, basically. You could do a little bit at a time, uh, according to how much money you have. So we did um, uh, two thirds of its length, we're doing the last piece. and. Um, so here are just some of the uh, views, and you can see that the language is super simple. The planking is uh, basically the same um, as the benches is used for lighting. Um, uh, the tracks are brought back in. Uh, there is a kind of emergent growth that comes between the cracks. Um, some of the, uh, uh, the elements like the tracks are reused for um, uh, post-industrial leisure culture in different ways for lounges and some of the atmospheres. It's so, it's so weird, it's just in reverse. So everything that's, <laughs> I mean, I guess you're used to it by now. So this should be blue light, it, it, but the black and white is the same. It's, it's interesting and everything that is blue goes red and everything that's red goes blue. So these are some of the atmospheres. And, um, and then um, something very interesting um, started to happen. So this project was immensely popular. Um, um, and, but I'm kind of starting to focus on all the things that we didn't intend. You know, architects try to imagine different things happening and then everything goes the wrong way or a different way than you imagine. And some of the most beautiful things about the High Line are the things that we had nothing to do with, and in fact, we pride ourselves in not having screwed up what was already there. So um, that's a big act of um, architecture, is knowing how strong a voice to have. Our voice was, was very soft um, in the whole thing. But, but something like um, this, this is one of the tenements that's just along the High Line. And um, during the construction, uh, this was like midway through, there was, a, there was a, a construction light that was focused on this part of the building just by accident. And it happened to be that uh, behind that, uh, uh, that apartment, that those windows, was a cabaret singer. And she would come out now every night at 7.30 and she would perform for the audience. And it just happened to be that she was in the spotlight of the construction line. Um, and so this just kind of happened and, um, and many things um, just kind of happened, like, like this is a building that was, uh, it's a hotel that was built over the High Line. It's the last and the only one that um, it, it was zoned for possible, this, this particular part of the site, um, where you could actually build over the High Line. So uh, the developer did, and um, that hotel is all glass. And what happens is that the public that comes to visit it has this audience that is basically coming and down, up and down the High Line all the time. And there uh, is this fantastic performance that happens. And, um, you know, and it's kind of, you know, people have come to know um, that, uh, 
that this is kind of a sad performance and, and there's a kind of mutual agreement that uh, people are very kind of interested, so it's a two-way audience and performers. Anyway, um, so much is um, kind of happens on the High Line and be has become so popular. Um, this is an establishing shot for the Family Guy, which is a very popular um, animated uh, cartoon in the US. Um, this is a Marvel Comics. So it, it's, it's come into popular culture in such an interesting way. And, um, you know, we, every day we're surprised by something else. This is um, a Highline perfume. It's called Bond Number no. 9. It's the world's first railroad fragrance. And it advertises itself as the scent of wildflowers, green grasses, and urban renewal. So that has nothing to do with the High Line. It's just, you know, by the way, the, the name High Line is um, uncopyrightable. You, we, so we have, everyone could call themselves the High Line this and the High Line that. And there are a lot of profiteers that, uh, um, that basically, um, you know, are, are taking benefit off the High Line. But there's a lot of buzz and a lot of things are going on and most of which we have nothing to do with. This, this is actually one that we did have something to do with. There was a, but this has to do with all the buzz. It was a competition for Miss, for a gown from Miss Meatpacking District. And so we made this bacon and salami dress and um, it actually won. Um, but the, um, so this is a little bit of the, what has been a termed of as the high line effect. And you could see um, everything you love and hate about New York because you know, we, we kind of love it. It's a great opportunity to see New York from another vantage point, but we don't love sharing it. We don't love that it's increasing property values now. So um, these are all the buildings, or uh, maybe not all, at a certain point we made this. They're just a sampling of the buildings that are uh, coming up all around the High Line as it has increased in value. So what was considered to be a liability um, it, for developers has now become a kind of catalyst of development and lit, you know, it was a huge surprise to, to everyone involved um, that an investment of the city that cost 150 million in total has generated as of last year 2 billion in development. Um, so um, what's also surprising is that the High Line has gone viral and there are High Lines proliferating all over the country and the world. Um, over three dozen cities at the last count uh, were doing high lines and um, basically rushing to turn their obsolete infrastructure into public parks, aspiring to revitalize a kind of highlight effect of the, a high line effect of their own. Um, and we don't, and so these are just some taking off of the internet, um, really cities all, all around, and they keep, they keep happening. Um, this is back to our High Line, and um, we were wondering, well, why is this so successful, you know, and why is it such a spark? And, and it's, you know, it's, it's kind of uh, obscene because um, Promenade Planté did it first in Paris, and we learned from Promenade Planté, we did uh, basically a New York, very, very New York-centric version of something that had already been done, done on a viaduct. And now Paris is interesting to, uh, interested in what we did here and wants to bring a High Line to Paris, which is really, you know, un, like we can't really process that. So everything has gone in this kind of weird loop, um, even though they were the original. Um, but in thinking about why the success of the High Line, um, at least to New Yorkers and um, in our view, it has to do with introducing New Yorkers to the concept of doing nothing. And um, so here is the spur, and there is a, a kind of a seating area, a grandstand that looks onto 10th Avenue, and from there, basically, you see traffic moving. So, um, you know, we have this kind of theory of nothingness um, that uh, a lot of our work is somehow touching on the kind of aesthetics of nothing, but, but nothing in a kind of productive uh, urban context is, is very, I, I would say unusual. Um, if we're not in our offices being productive, we're at the gym burning calories or at the park walking our dogs or between these points consulting our devices. 
Um, the High Line doesn't offer anything to do. You can't ride a bike, you can't throw a ball, there are no dogs, no lo rollerblading. You can basically walk or sit. Um, and so that is that spur looking down over 10th Avenue. Um, and so this notion, this, this kind of notion of doing nothing is um, strongest in this one place um, where basically you're star staring at taillights of cars going up 10th Avenue the way we blankly stare into a fireplace or a lava lamp. And you know, somehow, um, I, I don't understand the phenomenon, you know, I, we thought that this would be cool, but um, it is a very kind of popular spot. Um, and um, we did this kind of this uh, sped up video on the High Line. Um, we're, we're, we're trying to kind of understand the, the phenomenon of the park. Um, generally, urban parks are typically an escape from the city but you go to the Highland to re-enter the city, but you enter its unconscious, the imperfect, the overlooked, the blank party walls, the innards of buildings, the loading docks and chop shops at arm's distance from cars parked in the air on mechanical lifts next to fire, next to fire escapes and smokestacks floating at the height of giant underwear ads. And even as the condos go up, the Highland will always refuse to fit neatly into the logics of the city. Um, this accidental ecosystem we found at the beginning of the project has spawned a new ecosystem in which natives, tourists, artists, executives, socialites, club kids, cruisers, retirees, sunbathers, fitness buffs, fashionistas, and even flashers produce a new biodiversity, which is purely New York. Um, it's, it's basically impossible to replicate the High Line. Um, its magic is a product of the unintended, basically, with a slight adjustment. Um, while I can't imagine replicating the High Line in all of these copycat High Lines, um, its concept, um, of course, needs to be um, nuanced um, into all sorts of existing sites and logics. Uh, but what we find, you know, while, while it's, uh, you know, I'm a little skeptical that everything will be, all of these attempts will be as popular, um, what's great is that so many uh, civic leaders around the world are creatively repurposing infrastructure rather than tearing it down. So we're, we feel like we've contributed uh, something uh, in that regard um, that is repeatable. Um, I want to, uh, as the last project, I want to introduce um, a, a new project that is a kind of passion um, in real time right now. Um, and it's coincidentally located at the very northern edge of the High Line. So you see there mostly um, north, south, the river is on the east, and then there the, uh, the High Line goes around the uh, Hudson Yards, which is a place where all these trains are basically, it's the Long Island Railroad, and they come there and they park there, and, but it's a moving and active railroad yard. Um, so it's a project um, that we're working on um, uh, that is, um, that really does kind of ta bring us back to kind of where, where I started the talk. Um, one that is testing the architect's agency um, of what is typically uh, expected. So architects typically inherit programs. We try to make, we try to critique them. We try to make projects better, the museum a better museum. Uh, we try to be responsive, but uh, this project is a proactive project on behalf of um, architects as well as other uh, folks coming together, um, but is not a part of an institutional construct. So the city of New York uh, published an RFP um, to make a proposal um, for this site. And it's just a 21,000 square feet, not very big site. Um, uh, it could go up 100 feet. And Hudson Yards is a very large development where there's going to be 13 million square feet. That's basically on top of the rail yard. So it's the last undeveloped track in Manhattan. And um, it's huge. And the reason it hasn't been built on is no one has figured out a way of bringing structure up in between the trains. It's very expensive. So um, this, this new um, uh, development will do just that. 
and we'll build, and all those tall buildings are gonna be built all around there um, uh, on top of this platform that will happen. So the city of New York put out a proposal for a new cultural user for this very small site um, and um, and we responded, and I think, and David Rockwell. So it's interesting that it's the same uh, two, two uh, architects working together again uh, that responded to this RFP. I believe um, we are the only to the, the only response that the city got. And mind you, this was 2008, so it was a moment of another crisis, um, a, a national crisis, um, where um, uh, basically the uh, bottom fell out of the economy. Um, yet, the city was asking for a cultural use for the site. And so we asked ourselves, um, there are 1,200 cultural institutions in New York already, um, why does New York need another one? And then um, we started to think, well, um, there, uh, um, New York um, actually doesn't have, um, uh, well, while we call ourselves kind of the center of everything, we actually are not. And uh, New York has kind of fallen out of phase in terms of pioneering new things, whereas MoMA was once a pioneer in 1929. Um, MoMA now sits as a kind of giant powerhouse. Um, and where once New York was a center of art production, now it's the center of the market. Um, so we um, asked ourselves, well, what could a new institution do? Um, and these principles um, were really the starting points. So despite its vast array of cultural venues, New York um, exhibition and performing arts venues exist in autonomous silos, and they're unable to serve a growing tendency of creative work across disciplines. Um, this new venue would merge visual and performing arts with fashion, design, publishing, broadcast, culinary arts, basically the creative industries. Um, transformable and scalable. Uh, new York City doesn't have a premier exhibition space that's versatile um, and responsive to ever-changing needs and demands of contemporary art practices, changes in size and media and te technological complexity. The new venue would be flexible and on demand. New York does not have a brand neutral venue that can showcase high quality local and global exhibitions and events unencum unencumbered by the long lead calendars, special interests, high costs, and bureaucracies associated with traditional museums and performing arts centers. Um, perhaps the um, uh, excluding, well, perhaps the closest precedent um, to a culture shed for us is the Fun Palace by Cedric Price, um, developed in the, in the early 60s. Um, now, Fun Palace um, evolves out of post-war England. It's a whole different thing. Um, the notion of automation posed a threat to um, crisis in excess of human time, that is unconsumed human energy, um, is connected to a certain politics of class, you know, which was very specific to England. And, um, you know, there are a couple of images of the Fun Palace. Um, while not directly uh, in our consciousness, Price's seminal anti-building that he called uh, 50 years before produced a kind of ethos in our, the architectural community without which Culture Shed could never have been conceived. And um, Fun Palace was um, conceived uh, to transcend the specificity of program and the neutrality of the one-size-fits-all generic box. So something other than that. It sought to make architecture a real player in a dynamic and rapidly changing culture. For architecture to house an indeterminate and unknowable program, it too had to be in indeterminate. The notion of architecture as infrastructure with a plug-in kit of parts could be self-regulating, a self-regulating system that adapted to constantly evolving programs. Um, this was a great innovation, and it used cybernetics and real-time feedback. The whole kind of beauty of this, of this project that most of you are probably familiar with. Um, but the project was unrealized, um, and it's firmly constructed, however, in the imagination of many generations following the 60s. Um, so coming back to the culture shed, um, one way that it, differ, it uh, differs um, is 
this self-sustainable strategy. Um, New York City institutions are totally driven by private philanthropy, and given the lack of government support for the arts and the decline of private philanthropy during the financial downturn, the proposed institution would find a new model of uh, cultural entrepreneurism, and this is what we had in mind. Um, not entirely self-sustaining, but at least a larger part than is most of the other institutions um, in the city and the country. Um, so Culture Shed is kind of an unapologetic, <laughs> wow, um, unapolog uh, unapologetic marriage of culture and commerce, uh, a public-private venture conceived to maintain financial self-reliance uh, through a uniquely curated uh, mix of for-profit and non-for-profit programming. Um, the for-profit uh, pro uh, programming would be seen through the filter of creative industry, and there you could see um, the different kinds of produced, co-produced, and presented events, and generating events, and the intersection um, that is intended to yield um, a kind of liberty and freedom a kind of uh, a curatorial freedom that doesn't really exist so much in the other institutions in New York. Now, it would sit right um, in the yards next to the High Line, and it would be a complement. On the other side is the New Whitney Museum, so um, kind of two anchor. This was not anticipated when we, when we began, uh, but new um, anchor cultural institutions at the High Line, giving the High Line a kind of different uh, purpose now connecting these cultural pieces like a mall with two anchor stores, very weird. Um, but like um, uh, the uh, Fun Palace, Culture Shed is conceived of as infrastructure. So it comprises uh, basically a, a three-story, actually five-story building, uh, three stories of um, of uh, galleries, large high galleries, uh, museum quality exhibition space, and on top of it is a telescoping outer shell. When deployed, it can double the footprint of the shed. Um, and um, it uses this um, gantry crane technology, which is very familiar and, and simple technology, but updated. And basically, in the stacks of spaces, um, and of which there are also some below the level of the high line, um, they're basically conditioned spaces of different sizes with power, light, and open infrastructure to allow the system to be updated for endless possibilities of art artistic engagement. Um, and the expanded uh, building can uh, take extra large exhibitions. So this is actually in this very large part. It could take on very large exhibitions, but it could also host large concerts and theatrical events. Um, and it, and it can also be independently deployed. So you could have a concert and not dis disturb the um, exhibitions. You could have an income generating event and not disturb what's going on in the stack of, of uh, st uh, spaces. So, um, and you don't have to open it up. It can open um, partially and um, it can open to demand. So you don't have to condition it, heat it, program it when you don't need it. Um, so this is just the, one of the regular stack of gallery spaces. Um, this is the interior of the shed. It's a very high space. And um, some other kind of public uses um, when it's not used for culture, um, it's used um, and open to the public. Um, and any kind of events, public and private events, can host fashion shows. Um, the structure um, and the mechanics, this is um, really an engineering and architectural project. There's very little fat on this skeleton, uh, but basically it's very precisely um, uh, designed. So back to back, we have mechanical system and structural system, uh, and in between we have ETFE pillows. So the cross section looks something like this. Uh, ETFE on the outside, and the space between the mechanical and the structural is a space for the shading devices. Um, so this building can be entirely climatized and an entirely uh, controllable en environment, um, and it could be darkened. Um, and um, to span the long distance, um, it needs a very thick uh, roof structure, and in that roof structure, um, is basically inhabitable, and it's a theatrical deck. So the entire 
uh, span of the shed in every direction is a place where you can rig and it's all full of strong points so you can suspend from any point there. So it's really a big machine. This is in that space. And um, you can see that it's basically like a big theatrical ceiling. Uh, the wheels are big and um, this is just the program configuration sometimes. Very often it looks like it's on the upper left and occasionally, um, let's say 50% of the time, the shed moves out and creates an opportunity for independent events or uh, large-scale exhibitions where exhibition is everywhere or sometimes and less frequently um, creative industry events like uh, Fashion Week that take over the whole building for a week and a half twice a year uh, to public-private events and so forth or all public and in the summer it's opened up with basically the infrastructure there uh, to host all sorts of open air uh, performances. So this is a little animation that we just made. So this is the platform that uh, they're going to be building out. Now Culture Shed is back to back um, with on its west side with a residential building which we have taken on also with David Rockwell in self-defense um, to the culture shed and it's really our first commercial project. But it, that tower holds the offices and uh, a lot of the infrastructure. infrastructure. Um, now here is um, loading is from below the high line and now looking at a section right through, you see the truck coming to the loading dock. But also a truck can, um, because of the topography, end up on the plaza level and can unload. And then loads can be hoisted up and delivered into the galleries directly. So this apparatus can also um, uh, work as a tool. And this is, um, I have to say for any um, art people in the audience, and I see Max there, I apologize in advance, the architects curated this, this thing, um, and it's not exactly the way we would, um, or even what we envisioned to be there. It, it actually holds lo loads more than that. But, uh, so, but, but just to show the different ways that the space can expand, um, it can be um, shaded off. And it truly promotes um, interdisciplinary work. I mean, this is a very important uh, issue in, in our minds that, that, uh, that space is very much equated to the kind of art that's there. Art is repeated because the space is the same. You have 20 foot high galleries, you'll have 20 foot high work being produced um, and uh, the opportunity to actually have an exuberant space even in a time when uh, of, of an economic recession now recovery um, is a, a kind of opportunity to think big and to use the opportunities of the large space to host different kinds of events. So I'll just uh, speak over the, I, there, are, there are many lessons um, that to be learned from the Fun Palace, for, between the Fun Palace and Culture Shed. Um, then technology was the answer. Um, today the speed of obsolescence makes technology a liability. Dumber is better. Uh, the best thing to do for culture in the future is to secure real estate. Um, then systems theory, game theory, and cybernetic control systems were tools to democratize culture. Now, digital technologies um, 
enable culture to be open source, dispersed, and on demand. However, with democracy comes the ubiquitous condition of being monitored. Then kit of parts and kinetic systems produced flexibility. Now flexibility could be a paradox. The more mechanical flexibility is built in, the more is predetermined, leaving nothing more flexible than empty space. That's why for us, dumbness was a virtue here. Um, totally, totally open infrastructure and just uh, muscle. Um, then disciplinary borders had to be broken. Now, despite academia's parsing and classification, the richly indeterminate contours of dis interdisciplinarity now are ca categories of intradisciplinarity, uh, multidisciplinarity, transdisciplinarity, and cross-disciplinarity. Um, so I don't know really what that means, but we're in this kind of weird other place that's rather than being holistic is kind of subdivided again. Then government support for culture was assumed. Now to avoid the vicissitudes of the economy, the cultural institution must produce its own financial security. Then uh, the, architecture, the architect is a generalist who gathers research from subcommittees. Now the new culture of professionalism turns the architect into a director producer that relies on a growing cadre of subconsultants who bring an ever widening depth of expertise to ever more adventurous problems. We have about 30 specialists on board. Then and now, the architect pushes the agency of the profession to invent the cultural or civic project. Um, we put it on the table. The city was already kind of wanting to do something with fashion on the site. The city really embraced this project and um, f allowed us to kind of continue developing it. Um, and then the institution became totally independent from the city and now is its own thing. And it is, um, as the drawings are developing, uh, for this project, so too is the whole institution. So it's a very rare thing for architecture and an institution to be growing at the same time. Usually an institution evolves and architecture follows. Here they're being done at the same time. Um, for us, the top heavy structure of the museum um, is something that we feel is something of the past. Uh, Culture Shed offers scalability and agility to adapt to an intricate programming um, strategy for an unknowable future. It offers a new paradigm of cultural entrepreneurship for arts of the 21st century. Um, and with its variable program and spatial elasticity, um, Culture Shed can be spontaneous and responsive to multiple and simultaneous desires. Um, it exists and will exist in a perpetual state of change um, Hans Ulrich Oberst, um, a kind of, uh, I coined this, or he coined this expression, uh, which I've now really have loved and adapt, is um, basically Culture Shed um, is in a permanent state of surprise. And it will open its doors in 2018. And that's all I have. Thank you. Do I, I like the color blue. I, you know, I was the only one that didn't see it uh, the way you saw it. <laughs> it was, um, I think it was kind of really nice to just lose control of whatever the visuals were. So, um, you know, I, and, I, and uh, my partner, um, Charles Renfro, um, likes blue. And I never thought I would. And I've de evolved a kind of interest in that color. So there must be something faded here. That's one. Is that one and a half? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, one comment is I'm really curious what Mark Wrigley was saying about the Cedric Price project. This is kind of it's really excited. But why did it actually move again? Why, did, why wasn't it just a static structure like just do everything? Um, well, first of all, we don't have all the property. So the, the site is a small site. And uh, we could build a building on there. And next to us happened to be a, an open public space. Um, so we figured, well, why not um, have the opportunity to double the, floor, the footprint of the space? Um, and it was to enable the building to, you know, be, because it moved, it wasn't subject to the same kind of regulations that a fixed building would be. But we also felt that from a sustainability standpoint, um, you don't have to always heat it and cool it or program it. You can use it when you need to. So it's an on-demand kind of structure. 
and when you, it will enable this institution to have super large shows, to have theatrical events, and to be able to do multiple things at the same time without disturbing the other. And then Mark is supposed to say something. <laughs> You're doing crits all day. You could do a crit. <laughs> He's shy. He'll tell me what he really thinks over dinner. Yeah, I, I, my thought was about the question. I mean, if you if you uh, think about the um, incredible influence of what the Highland did to the city, and I thought that that was a very nice that you rounded off your talk with these last two projects, especially also the Highland, because you linked it so beautifully to 